One topic of tremendous importance to linear algebra and that comes up over and over again in machine learning is the idea of orthogonality. Orthogonality, fundamentally, is just the idea of two vectors being perpendicular to each other. That is to say, two vectors are orthogonal if they are at 90 degrees to one another. And this corresponds to the inner product being zero. You can convince yourself of this just by thinking about the fact that if I have vectors x and y, and I consider their inner product, that is equal to the magnitude of x, or the length of x, multiplied by the length of y, multiplied by the cosine of theta. If the dot product is zero, and the lengths of the vectors are not zero, then what do we require of cosine theta? Well, it either needs to be 90 degrees or negative 90 degrees. So we say that x and y are orthogonal if their inner product is zero. We can also add the additional requirement that x and y each have length one, in which case we would call them orthonormal. One reason we think quite a lot about orthonormal vectors is because we like to use them to construct orthonormal matrices. If you imagine taking a set of orthonormal vectors for which all of the dot products are zero and all of the links are one, imagine making those vectors into the column vectors of a matrix, then we would call that an orthonormal matrix. Let's imagine that A is an orthonormal matrix. And what that means is, is that A transpose A equals identity. And also A transpose A. One way to just kind of see why this happens is to think about a matrix A and its transpose. So let's imagine that we have A transpose and A. And we said that one of these matrices is orthonormal if the columns, if we'll say the columns are orthonormal vectors. And so they then are the rows over here. So we can think about what happens if we take this one and dot product with itself, then of course we get a one, right? So we would get a one here in the upper left corner, but because it's orthogonal to the others, then when we multiply it by this one, we get a zero. And this one also has a dot product with zero and so on. And then as we take each one of them, since it only has a non-zero dot product with itself, and in fact that dot product is one, then we're just gonna get ones along the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. You can see also that this implies that the transpose is the inverse. Recall that the inverse of a matrix is the matrix that you multiplied by in order to get the identity. And so then you can see that a transpose is a inverse. One of the reasons that we care a lot about orthogonal matrices is because they preserve lengths. What I mean by that is that if you hit a vector with an orthogonal matrix, it doesn't change the length of the vector. Let's imagine that we care about some vector x and it has some length. And now we come along and we hit it with an orthogonal matrix, let's say V. And we ask, what's the length of this guy? Now this is a positive number, so let's go on and, and square that. As we saw before, we can think of lengths in terms of the inner products. And so let's write this as the inner product between the matrix Vx and the matrix Vx. Now the square here being key, otherwise we would have taken the square root of the inner product. Following the convention that we've been using, then we can write this in terms of matrix multiplies like this. And we see that we have this quadratic form with the Vs in the middle. Now note that because of the property of orthogonality, this is identity. And so this is equal to x transpose x by itself, which of course is also equal to just the inner product of x with itself. And that is equal to the squared norm of x. So we can convince ourselves that 
if we hit X with an orthogonal matrix, that it preserves length. Interestingly, orthogonal matrices also preserve angles. Let's imagine that we have some X and Y, and we want to talk about their angle. And then we want to talk about their angle again after we hit them with an orthogonal matrix V. How do we think about angles? We know that cosine theta is equal to the inner product of X and Y. So theta being the angle between X and Y divided by the magnitude of X and Y or the product rather of the norms of X and Y. Now let's imagine that we hit X and Y each with this vector V. What's going to happen? Well, we get the inner product of V and X and V and Y. And we're dividing that by the norm of VX multiplied by the norm of VY. Now, as we saw before, these are the same. That is to say, because orthogonal matrices preserve lengths, we know that the denominator is the same. It's just the same as it is with the norm of X multiplied by the norm of Y. Let's write out the numerator though. So this is going to be now X transpose V transpose V Y. And this is divided, as we said, by norm x, norm y. Note, v transpose v is again identity. And so this gives us x transpose y divided by those norms. Which of course is just that inner product. And it's the same as it was before we involved V. So what we see is that cosine theta is the same even if we pre-multiply by some orthonormal matrix V. And so we can say then that that multiplication is angle preserving. Now let's talk about the idea of orthogonal projection. We imagine that we have a vector space V and a subspace U. If we have a linear map pi that goes from V to U, and it has the property that if I apply pi more than once, it doesn't change anything, then that's a projection. What do I mean by that? So if I take some X and I that's in V and I hit it with pi, and then I hit it again with pi, it needs to be the same as if I had only done it once. We can draw a picture of this idea by imagining that we have some, say, vector space V, and then let's imagine that there's some subspace U. Okay, so there's just R2 in a one-dimensional subspace. If I'm at some other location floating out here in, the, uh, in V, a projection sends me onto the subspace U, right? So V to U, so I'm in sort of V and then I go onto the line and it has the property then that where I land, if I was to apply that projection again, it wouldn't change where I go. And that's not too surprising because if I'm choosing say the nearest point on the line, then when I'm already on the line, the nearest point on the line is where I currently am. And so, this is why we often think of this kind of projection as an orthogonal projection because it's going to find the closest point on the, uh, on the subspace. So this is what we mean when we talk about the idea that applying pi twice doesn't change its value and that that's actually the sort of defining characteristic of a projection. So we could write that condition by saying that pi composed with pi or pi squared equals pi. So this is a linear map that has the property that repeated applications of the linear map are the same as a single application of the linear map. And of course, since this is a linear map, then we can express these things as matrices, 
And so this would have the property that if I had some matrix P representing that, then multiplying P by itself, or we could write P squared, so that's squaring is just matrix multiplication, but just multiplying it by itself, then that still needs to equal the matrix P. Let's imagine that we have some X in V. And that when we apply our projection, what we're doing, let's, let's write that as saying pi u for projecting onto u of the vector x. Now, let's further imagine that we have an ordered basis for u. And let's denote that as b, and it'll have a b1, a b2, and so on. We can think about this as producing some set of coordinates in this ordered basis. So if we were to write pi u of x, then it must be the case that there is some set of lambda coordinates in which we can represent that projection. So this is saying that on the subspace, we have an ordered basis for the subspace, and after we apply the projection, we landed on the subspace, and so we must be able to find a set of coordinates for that basis. What we'd like to be able to do is, given b's representing the subspace, and given some x, we'd like to be able to find the lambdas. That is, we'd like to be able to find kind of where we are in the subspace, given where we started with x. First, let's stick with some of the convention that we've used earlier, and let's take this ordered basis and write this as a matrix in which the columns are going to be the, uh, the ordered basis, and lambda is now going to be a vector that is the coordinates for that basis. Just a concise way of writing it with a matrix B multiplied by a vector lambda. Lambda has the same dimensionality as the subspace. The key property of an orthogonal projection is that we can think about the difference between where we started and where we landed. And so if we think about pi of x minus x, that's a vector. And that vector is sort of sticking up out of the subspace, right? It's orthogonal to the subspace. If it weren't orthogonal, it wouldn't have picked the closest point. So because that's true, then that vector must be orthogonal to all of the vectors in the subspace. That means from our point of view that it must be orthogonal to all of the basis vectors in particular. We could say that by saying that the vector x minus the projection of x must be orthogonal to every vector in U. Let's think about the condition then that we need, which is that the inner product of this vector and each of the Bs, each of the basis vectors, must be zero. So we could write that by saying that B1 transpose multiplied by X minus pi U of X is zero. This is nothing fancy, this is just the inner product between B1 and the difference between X and the projection of X onto the subspace U. That is true for all of the basis vectors B. In fact, what that lets us do is write this system of linear equations in terms of matrices. Taking advantage of things we've defined, we can write this as B transpose multiplied by x minus b lambda equals zero. And in fact, we could simplify that a little bit and write this as the equation b transpose x equals b transpose b lambda. And sometimes we call this the normal equation. This comes up a lot in least squares and lots of different kinds of machine learning problems, it turns out. Interestingly, if we think about B transpose B, that's a square matrix, and because B had full column rank, that is to say that it has fewer columns than the dimensionality of V, but each of those columns is linearly independent, then this is in general going to be an invertible matrix. And so what that means is we can solve for lambda by multiplying both sides by the inverse of B transpose B. 
Now this is a very powerful thing to do because it lets us solve for lambda. That is, it lets us solve for the location of the projection. That is the location where we landed in the basis represented by B. Lambda is useful, of course, but we'd like to know the actual location. And so what we can do then is substitute this back into this equation and get our final answer. So the projection of x, that is pi u of x, is equal to b multiplied by lambda, which is this quantity. So b transpose b inverse b transpose x. As a practical matter, this is the p that we identified earlier. So p pi from a few minutes ago, that projection matrix is b, b transpose b inverse b transpose. Of course, a good sanity check is that we want it to be the case that p pi squared still equals just p pi. So let's just check that and convince ourselves that it's true. p squared is equal to b. So this is one and then, and then here's the other. So multiplying one, multiplying p by itself. What we immediately see here is that these two guys are going to cancel, right? And so then we're going to be left with b b transpose b inverse b transpose. And of course, this is equal to p pi. So we're happy because it appears that when we multiply p by itself, we get p back again, which is the property that we require for a matrix representing a linear projection.